Welcome to the LPP Podcast. LPP is the Life Process Program, a non-12-step program for people who want to ameliorate addiction and addiction-related issues in their lives. And by the way, when I say addiction, I don't mean only drug and alcohol addiction, but also addiction to love, sex, gambling, pornography, technology, and a whole range of other experiences. To learn more about our program, or to check out free resources like articles, videos, blogs, and podcast episodes related to solving addiction-related problems, visit our website at lifeprocessprogram.com or follow us on social media using any of the links in our show notes. You're listening to a segment called MMA, Monday Morning Ammunition. Some of our shows are long-form interviews, Monday Morning Ammunition episodes are short educational segments that you might listen to during your Monday morning routine or Monday morning commute. Today you're going to hear part eight, the last part of an eight-part discussion that I recorded with LPP founder Dr. Stanton Peel. And you may wonder, what's the significance of eight separate segments? Well, our program consists of eight modules, each of which encourage participants to think critically about different dimensions of their lives and what it is they'd like to accomplish. So today we discuss Module 8, Greater Goals, Pursuing and Accomplishing Things of Value. Enjoy the show. The last module is called Greater Goals, Pursuing and Accomplishing Things of Value. All right, now you have the skills, you have articulated your own problems, your own strengths, and you figured out what kinds of strengths, skills you'd like to build? I mean, where are the growth areas? How are you going to incorporate that into a a social life and connectivity and one of purpose and meaning? And how are you going to act in a mature way and take responsibility for things and have self-agency with all that bundled together? Now let's look forward. It's the end of the program, but it's the beginning of a new way of thinking about yourself and about the future. The greatest antidote and preventive from addiction is having a purpose in life. You know, what I always say, you work with children all the time. I mean, I have children and grandchildren. And what I'm always looking for in any human being is that they have some kind of dedication, some kind of commitment. You happen to know my grandson, Cassius. And, uh, you know, Cassius, even when he was 10 years old, would say, animals are my passion. I, I You know, he interacted with your lizard and your dog so you know about that yeah and getting back to the kids who were interviewing me to do a video a a movie about you know gaming or digital addiction the main thing i'm thinking about is well these guys these they really want to do something they want to do something positive they want to make a movie they know how to make a movie this is a worthwhile thing and as I said to them, you know, if you have, it's, I want you to do your homework. I'm, I'm not telling you to avoid, you know, your reading and writing assignments and doing your math and chemistry assignments. But what gets most people through life is having a purpose, some kind of overriding goal, something that really motivates them, something they can be passionate about and care about. And in many cases, people have that. Maybe it's been buried, and they've not done that. I know you've worked with clients. I know you had one client who you encouraged to start writing his memoir about, um, where you saw that that gathered up what he was most skilled at and most motivated to do. And that's the last segment is how are you going to leave this program and go in a foray out into life with some larger goal in mind, some purpose, that can keep you on track because nothing prevents relapse better than having something that's more important than resuming the addiction. Even if there's some ups and downs in your career or your relationship or your commitment to God or your commitment to politics or the community or you're wanting to clean up the environment or you're wanting to be a musician or you're wanting to be an artist, all of those things are purposes, higher purposes. I don't mean higher purposes in terms of being religious. I mean higher purposes in terms of being something to get your eyes a little bit above ground level so that you're not just thinking about slogging through the mud on a daily basis. You have something you're aiming for, some kind of a purpose in life. And 
the we want in life process program we work on the mechanics of what that means and we work on the goal setting and the visualization of that we write about how there are the four pillars of recovery and the four pillars of recovery is developed it was done by an expert panel samsa substance abuse and mental health services administration and the four pillars are i'll go in reverse order health it's important to be healthy community which we've talked about home having some kind of a home base perhaps that involves currently especially skills of being alone but it involves intimacy and relationships and family but number 1 up front is purpose and some of the ways that you achieve purpose in a therapeutic way or some of the ways that we help people to do that by helping people to focus on their work or their education or how they're going to advance their job skills or how they're going to advance in their careers or how they're going to become better writers or better artists or how they're going to be more fulfilled in whatever it is that they do um we practice some skills in helping people develop that focus and building the ladders to achieve those kinds of things there are a million examples we can go back to my uncle oscar you know quitting smoking he had some overriding purpose in life he was a union organizer shop steward and smoking belittled and derided his concept of himself as somebody who was able to get, be independent of and strong enough to fight the company on behalf of himself and his fellow workers that's a purpose in life and people relapse sometimes when they're under stress when they let their guard down when they break up in a relationship when you know bad things happen in the world i'm some people must be relapsing right now in response to the epidemic but what always what keeps people going not only you know avoiding the addiction but overcoming a relapse episode is that they have some brighter broader farther reaching goal in front of them that they can't lose sight of that will always be with them um that will always be central to their identity and that will always keep them moving forward and whatever happens around their addiction will always retract them away from addiction we have given people or they have provided themselves with information and skill building around several dimensions of their lives at this point so when it comes to relapsing first i would like to know what that means to you and then i imagine that whatever relapsing means let's say it means if people were using drugs and their goal is to abstain from using drugs that, that they've used a the drug again. It, it, they almost have talked themselves up in a way that says that makes it impossible for the use of a drug to make them have to go back to the drawing board, back to square one, because that would almost be like saying all of these things that have built up. You have to ask yourself, is my using of a drug did that really devalue all of these things back to zero? And I think that if we're doing our jobs really well, then people would have to say, obviously, that's not true. But I want to turn that to you. What does relapse mean to you? And well, that's, I think that's said? exactly a good way to put it. it. The example I use is um, a woman who hadn't had a drink in six years. She went to a bar. Um, she had some spare time. It was near some Christmas shopping. She drank. She got drunk. She drove. She lost her license. She lost her job and she got divorced. That's a train ride to hell. And the woman could have gotten off that train at any point. She could have avoided going to the bar just because it was nearby and she had time on her hands. She could have gone to the bar and just had Coca-Cola. She could have gone to the bar and only had one and a half drinks. Even after she had a lot of drinks, she could have called her husband and said, you know, I've had this mishap please pick me up. I don't want to drive. She could have reached an understanding with her husband, even after all those bad things happened, she lost her uh, license. All of those things are choice points. 
people have choices at every point along the way, even if they've made mistakes. I mean, the other way I put that is to say the worst thing is always about to happen. No matter how bad things have gotten, things should always get worse. And as I pointed out with this particular woman, this was at a smart meeting, I said, well, you did a few things wrong there and you really ended up in a tailspin, but you haven't gone back to living your alcoholic lifestyle. I mean, she was now back to not drinking. She was now thinking about what she's going to do going forward. So it's rare. I mean, when I had a residential program, you know, you would get people who came in there who were pretty much on their last thread. I mean, they were in a bad, bad, bad place. We're less likely to get people that like that in life process program because we're an online voluntary program, you know, obviously it's not the same as being in a residential rehab. And when people left the place, we had active contact with them. We called them once a week. And believe it or not, some people used to get. And as I explained to the counselors, okay, you know, maybe they shouldn't have used again, but we had already done the relapse prevention exercise that we do in life process program. The bottom line is that they can't renege to the life they were leading before they entered our treatment, our rehab, or the life process program. Anything short of that is a success. I mean, obviously, some successes are greater. If you go and get drunk one night or even a whole weekend, okay, we're not encouraging that. But if you came to a rehab or the life process program because you were drinking constantly, that's still a triumph. Uh, that woman who lost quite a bit still only drank that one time. And now she wasn't back to the life of alcoholism. The letter, it turned out to be a smart recovery group. Redefining what you're doing is a success and making clear that the goal is that you cannot, you should not return to that thoroughly addicted bottom of the pit status that brought you here. Anything, getting off the train anywhere before doing that is some form of success. And we want to get off that train earlier rather than later. But you always have that choice, even after you've become, let's say, intoxicated, even after you've had a binge, even after you've lost things as a result of doing that, you're still not back to being the addicted individual you were. You're still talking with me and you're conscious of the fact that you are able to recap your existence and put the brakes on that train. We're in a better place than you were before. You're not the uh, addicted individual you were to start this process. And let's revel in that. Let's respect that woman. You know, she lost a lot, but you had to take your hat off to her and say, well, look how strong you are. You're looking at all of that. You're facing up to all of that. Here you are. You haven't continued drinking. You've actually displayed tremendous strength in avoiding relapse. You haven't relapsed. And, uh, you know, that's our bottom line. We, we want people to get to a new plateau in life. We want them to escape their consuming addiction, which has dominated their life in a negative way. And we believe that people, are, everybody that we deal with is capable of getting to that point where they never will relapse fully to the addiction, the addicted person they once were. If we can, can we tie that into this sort of current event? You mentioned earlier in our talk that we're in the midst of a pandemic and, and, and a real one. I mean, we're, we're, most of us in the nation are hunkered down in our homes and there's a lot of uncertainty happening. And it is just like drinking was an event to that woman, and there were choices she could make around that event along the way. This is a, an event that's personal to a lot of people and a nationwide one and a worldwide one even. And I wonder, I guess, two questions about this. How are you dealing with and incorporating this event that you could that most people see as a negative one and a difficult one um, in your life? And how are you making the most of it and, and looking optimistically toward the future and for the people who have accessed our program, and there have been a lot more over the recent weeks, and probably um, due to this fact, 
how might you, you know, just any bit of general advice about how to help those folks stay optimistic and look forward in an optimistic way to the future? Well, when you began asking this question, I wanted to avoid becoming a pandemic philosopher. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, when I was looking, you know, it, if you turn on, if you read anything or turn on any television program, people tell you two things. Oh, the world is changing. Here's what you have to do. That's mm. number one. And number two is, damn, we don't know how it's all going to end up. Right. So that's two contradictory things. And I'm not, I'm confident about predicting quite a few things. I know that we're doing well, worse in America and dealing with addictions. How all of this works out, what people end up doing, how it affects human lives and society, I just don't know the answer to that. But, uh, you know, and I don't want to be smug, I feel I'm dealing with it relatively well. I'll give you, in a minor way, um, I used to go out to eat a lot, but I don't do that now because there are no restaurants and I don't get trust takeout food. I, I sort of don't understand that. If people are worried about germs or specific virus, I don't know how you can go out and trust the takeout place. It doesn't work for me. So I began cooking for myself again. You know, go to the supermarket, I buy fish, I wash them thoroughly, and then I bake them and I know it's okay. So obviously turning these small chores, learning how to, I walk up the stairs instead of getting on the elevator, you know, obviously, you can get paranoid being in an elevator if you're sitting there worrying about being six feet away from germs. <laughs> yeah, sure. And it's a form of exercise. I live on the third floor, which is actually the fourth floor because our ground floor doesn't have a number. So, you know, these are, I, don't, I wouldn't call them trivial, but I'd call them transition points. But it so happens in the world in, of history that right now I'm better suited than other human beings for spending a lot of time alone because as you know, Zach, I'm writing my memoir, which is called A Scientific Life on the Edge, My Challenge Changing Accepted Views of Addiction. And, you know, it involves me, you know, recreating my life. I started, you know, beginning my childhood. I go through my career and I happen to be 74 years old now. So, A, there's a fair amount of material, and B, some of it was pretty long ago. Although, you know, right now when I deal with 1992, that seems incredibly long ago. <laughs> you know, even though I, if I was born in 46, you know, I was already, I think I'm 46 years old in 1992, so I wasn't a child at that time. Um, and that in, it then involves efforts of memory. It involves efforts at going through my records, my books, my articles, my website. And it involves me contacting people, which is sort of funny and fun. Um, some of the people I'm writing about, I don't have completely positive relationships with. However, I did something with them at a certain time. And so I send them an email and I said, when did this happen? And, you know, I guess one of the advantages of a pandemic is, you know, people are fairly patient with uh, dealing with old connections and they have a little bit of time on their hands. And so I've been amazed that virtually everybody I've written to, I think just about everyone has gotten back to me with the information I requested, even if in some sense that information is kind of negative, something bad happened at a given time. And so we have all these goals from the Life Process Program. I mean, it would be hard to call some of this information-seeking intimacy, but they're, and they're obviously positive and supportive relationships. Um, one person I've kind of rekindled uh, is a man named Nick Heather, who wrote one of the earliest books in 1981 called Control Drinking. And uh, that happened at a time when I was in the middle of being vilified for saying that Control drinking, which is a form of harm reduction, was legitimate. And I didn't know Nick at all. And he wrote a book called Controlled Drinking, which just, it, it's his nature to be very thorough. <laughs> and that book has everything. It has every single study of treatment involving controlled drinking. It has 
uh, epidemiological studies of people who control their drinking just over the natural course of their lives. It has research about how alcoholics uh, in laboratory settings drink. It has historical information about temperance. And, you know, as I'm writing my memoir, I believe in some sense that book saved my life. And it so happens that Nick showed up in the United States in 1982 in part because he was writing a, revision, a paperback revision with an appendix dealing with some famous incident called Mary Pendry case, where she attacked some controlled drinking researchers. So he stayed at my house in the middle of this process. And I'm thinking, what a miracle that that happened, how valuable that book was. And it so happens that Nick is now helping me. He's the one who got me my current publisher for my memoir. And so Nick's not a, a warm and fuzzy guy. You know, he's not a huggable kind of a person. And yet, you know, I had to say, you know, Nick, you really made a difference in my life. And, you know, I just thought I'd tell you. And by the way, when did I come? He was the head of the National Addic Alcohol and Drug Research Center in Australia. When did you invite me out there to speak? Thank you for doing that. What year was that? And, you know, getting that kind of eliciting that kind of information. And, you know, you're he's not a warm, fuzzy bear, so you don't like to ask Nick for too many things. So, well, it depends if this goes on for 10 more years, this epidemic, how well I deal with it. But right now, I'm in the throes of completing this memoir. Um, I'm obligated to turn it in in May, and then I'm going to have to go through all the editing and revising and whatever. But being locked in a room, an apartment, kind of almost, you know, works for me. All right. So I think that one thing that sets us apart from other programs is that beyond being an affordable program, we're, it's like we're desperate to bring value to other people. That's really what we thrive on. And I hope that this podcast has done that. I hope it's helped people. This works as an adjunct to the other reading materials that we have, just to help people understand how to make sense out of addiction in life. Most people don't need help making sense out of life. They kind of do that on their own. And we're saying that addiction is no different than the rest of life. It's just another interesting add-on. Let's remap your thinking about yourself and addiction, move from negative to positive, and make it purposeful, meaningful, and connected. Do you have anything that you want to add about the program well, in general? I just want to give a little models? advertisement for you and the other coaches. I know all the coaches, thank God, in the Life Process Program. We're a small enough shop that I have personal relationships with all of you. And what we're talking about is having real relationships, caring relationships, as you pointed out, seeking positive values and meaning in life. And I know all of my coaches are concerned, human beings that are, all of them have other, they all have children. So it's not like, you know, they're looking to latch on to other human beings to fill a gap in their life. They got things to do and people in their own lives to worry about. But all of you are serious, caring, purposeful, value-driven human beings who want and care to help other people to experience those positives in their own lives as a way of transitioning out of problems and addiction. I, I, I couldn't have more faith and confidence in saying that I really think the LPP coaches are a rare and treasured lot of people. I treasure working with them, and I feel that every client will experience that as well. Thank you so much, Stanton, and thanks for taking time out today to, to interact with the people who are participating. It's a pleasure, Zach, and thank you for your positive role in LPP in this uh, interaction. <clears throat> in your own family, and then, well, not this second, you're not actually working at schools, but, you know, bringing value to everything you do. So, good night, and we'll sign out from LPP. LPP.